So nobody will know everybody. Oh, there's my friend Jane. Wow. Hi, everybody. Ellen, I know you're doing the presentation. I'm wondering if I could sort of put my question on the table um, um, before it starts. I have, okay? I, I have somebody who's monitoring the chat with all the questions. So how about oh. you put it in the chat? Sure, I will do that. Thank you. Unless it's logistical and it has something to do no, with- No, 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 no. It's, it's sort of, I'm not, an avid, you know, an expert photographer like most of the people in the group, and I'm trying no, to. I, I don't think most of the people here okay. are expert photographers. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Irene. There is a range of people here. I guarantee. There are probably some non-photographers too. Now we know what it's like like waiting for the liftoff of a rocket. That's right. T minus, T minus two minutes. I would imagine that would be a whole lot scarier. <laughs> My name is Alan. I'm from Brookline, Massachusetts. And speaking of rockets, that's mission control behind me. But if you look in the western sky at about 843, you're supposed to be able to see the ISS tonight. Really? From where? Uh, probably some point that faces west. From Philadelphia, I could watch it. Maybe again. Maybe I'm in not. Brookline, uh, about right. two miles uh, west of Boston. I'm in Newton, I'm in, so I'm in Tennessee. We have over we have overcast in Tennessee, so I can't see it tonight. How will it look compared to the stars or other planets? Will it stand out? Well, according to Channel Five here in Boston, it's going to be just another star in the sky, probably a much brighter star. And it's definitely going to be traveling uh, across the sky from south to north. Um, that's all they basically told us. Um, that's about it. I saw it a couple of weeks ago in Norfolk, two nights in a row. It look, you, It's amazing how much you can see. Yeah, it's really quite obvious, Ellen. When, it, when you see it, you know it. Yeah, you see the antennas, everything. And I'm sure you see, see the motion. Most did they wave to you? Um, they did. And it, it goes so quick the over the sky. Okay, 8 o'clock. There's Carol Bear. Here we go. Are we ready to look now, folks? Let's see yeah. my cousin Hold David. On one second. Let me uh, I see my spotlight. friend from 7th grade, Carol Bear. Yay. Can we, can we get everybody to mute now? Can we can do that, David? I believe... If, you if mute everybody all, hasn't mute muted, us. I will mute everybody and then give me a moment to unmute each of you. Or you can unmute yourself as host. So yeah. hold on one second. Yeah. 
and David, are you unmuted? Do a mic test, please. I'm unmuted, um, and as soon as you give me the signal, I'm uh, ready to roll. You're good to go. We are recording, okay. and welcome, everybody. Well, good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm David Greenfield. Uh, on behalf of my co-chairs, uh, David Duchin and Andy Fandel, I welcome you to this FJMC Photography Affinity Group webinar about the exciting new world of smartphone photography. As a reminder, the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, or FJMC, is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. We work hard to provide value to the members and the Jewish community. To date, FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. Our speaker tonight is Ellen Faust a uh, sought after speaker and award-winning photographer who relies exclusively on her iPhone. She's also an educator of university educators, which fortuitously for, fortuitously for us makes her a consummate teacher. When I first heard Ellen speak about a year ago, not only was I inspired by her work, but impressed that she recognized early on that today's smartphone coupled with its AI, artificial intelligence, has started a new photography revolution as impactful as the previous shift from analog to digital. As such, Ellen made the conscious decision to become, as she describes herself, a mobile photographer using only the camera she never leaves home without. As you might expect, there's big time interest in tonight's topic. The interest is confirmed by over 150 registrants signing on from dozens of states and in Europe. Rest assured there will be something for everyone to help you ramp up your artistry. When not making photos, um, Ellen could be found helping faculty teach effectively uh, online from her position at UMass Boston. She holds an MA in art history and a master's in education and instructional design from the University of Massachusetts. So before we get into the program, just a few housekeeping details. Uh, we want this session to be interactive, but as David just mentioned for now, please mute yourselves and enter questions in the chat. We'll pause to present the questions to Ellen periodically throughout the one hour webinar. At 9 p.m., we'll stop the recording but keep the room open an additional 10 to 15 minutes for those who wish to linger for further discussion. So with no further ado, I give the floor to Ellen. Well, thank you. It's daunting to see 82 people here. It's really quite amazing. Uh, I wanted to thank David uh, for inviting me to, 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 to deliver this, um, let's think of it as a conversation because I too would like it to be interactive. And my goal is to get you thinking, not to lecture at you. I, I don't know how to do that. Um, so thank you, David. And I'd all, I'm, I'm, I'm also very honored and, uh, and humbled at, at how many people are here. I, I, think, I, I think, as David said, I, I have recognized the, the cutting edgeness of smartphones against the poo-pooing of some of my photographer ca uh, um, colleagues who keep asking me to get a real camera. And I, I respond that I actually have a real camera. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share PowerPoint and we're going to look at some slides. Uh, before we get started with the, the meat of what I'll be talking about or we'll be talking about together, uh, I'm going to show a two, I think it's about two and a half minute. I, I picked about uh, 50 random pictures from uh, among my best, my best pictures. So you'll see pictures of uh, the pond that's behind me. If I move over, you can get a preview. This is Bullo's Pond, which is about uh, a mile from my home that I photograph um, for a while. I've been there almost every day. I check the clouds out my backyard. And when I see clouds, I, I go running to the pond because I know it'll be very beautiful. Um, and you'll see pictures of a bike rack. That bike rack is outside of the integrated science complex at UMass Boston where I work. And I was able to see it in all different kinds of weather and all different 
um, lighting conditions. I like to go back to the same place over and over and over again and to look at it from, um, from, from di at different seasons and at different times of day because I, the subject of my, of my photographs is the light. And I think that'll be obvious when you see them. The subject could be very mundane, it could be a mailbox, but it's really the light hitting the mailbox that I'm interested in. So um, I will share the screen and we'll get started. Let's see, okie doke, here we go, share, share. Okay, so that's the introductory slide, we're past that. So, so the, the first point that I'd like to make um, and, and it feels somewhat of a defensive stand and, and, and maybe it is, because I, I have the, not, not I have the feeling, I have the experience of, of people poo-pooing the smartphone as, oh, that little camera, and you really can't do that much with it. But I, I would like to um, show you that I have been actually uh, publishing my pictures. Uh, here, here is, uh, they're printed and on exhibit in the public library in the town where I live in, in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, here's an exhibit that I designed specifically for this wall in the um, the uh, JP Lick uh, in the ice cream shop um, about a mile from my house. So they have they are printable. Uh, iPhone pictures are printable at very high quality, up to about 11 by 14 frames, 16 by 20, which is a reasonable size to put on your dining room wall. Um, they've been featured online. And some of the people here are from online photo communities that I belong to. Um, they're for sale on the website of the Newton Art Association. And, and, and when I sell them, they're printed out. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. And, and here's an example of one of, the, one of my photos that's in a publication. It, it's, it's a magazine published by UMass Boston, and they've appeared in literary magazines. And, and when I submit them, I don't say it's an iPhone picture, and they, they hold up. So, you know, I, I suppose I'm trying to, to, to convince you of this, but maybe I don't need to, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just to, I have to stop this share and share a slideshow that will be a couple of minutes. Let's see, share, and now, oh, your, your faces are blocking the button. I need to, when you see my mouse moving for no reason, it's because I'm actually dragging something on my screen. Okay, so here we go. Just to note to everybody, the the music behind the slideshow has been lost, but we are still seeing the slideshow, so bear with us, please. <clears throat> Ellen, say something. It might be working. Seems that she's mute. Uh, let me. She's mute. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I muted to talk to you and I turned off the music from the Senate slideshow.
Okay, so let's see. Gotta get my Zoom back. I didn't realize I muted my, <laughs> what happened? Did I mute my mic? Yes. And then it cut the music to the slideshow? Oh, well. Okay, so, uh, so now I'll share my screen again. And I hope you enjoyed that. And we'll get back to the PowerPoint. So those pictures were all taken either on, a, and you're hearing me now, right? Um, yes. Yeah, good. Yes. Okay. Yep, I'm back on. Um, they, they were, I've, I've had since, let's see, I had an iPhone 10 and then an iPhone 11 Pro. I just got an iPhone 12 Pro Max. None of those, those pictures were either the 10 or the 11 Pro. And I started with the four. So I, I've had a, a bunch of different um, iPhones. So let's get started. Um, so this was billed as a, as a lecture about artificial, talk about artificial intelligence and, and iPhone photography. But I want to assure you that it will not be a lecture on artificial intelligence and how it works because I really don't know. Um, it's much too mathematical and complicated for me. Um, but I'd like to talk together about three points. Um, what are the limitations of the smartphone camera? And then how can artificial intelligence or mathematical algorithms and machine learning compensate for these limitations that the camera has? Because it's a very small camera. It's a very small phone if it can fit in my pocket. And then the big question is, is the compensation for, by, by the software good enough that you could consider the iPhone or one could consider the iPhone a professional camera? And if so, then the question is a professional camera in what context? So I'm using it as a professional camera, but I'm not taking bird photography because I don't have a lens that will reach across the lake or, or um, serious night photography at the moment I can't do. So at the end of the, the hour, I hope that you have a new respect for the camera in your pocket and um, motivation to take it more seriously. Let's see, whoops. Okay, so we're gonna run a poll now with two questions on it. Um, David's gonna run the poll. Yes, actually, let me find the poll, I apologize. Uh, will one of the other hosts look to see if there's a poll that's available to them? Because I'm getting the message saying I'm logged in from another I've device. I've got it. I've got the poll. Thank you. Do poll number three. Oh, I don't have a choice. Down. I only yeah. have. Oh, let me see. Wait, maybe I do. I'm not. I'm not that familiar with poll. Oh, poll number three. Okay. I Thank will you. do poll number three. Uh, I, you don't see it uh, now. Launch it. Okay. So if everybody would please. Um, their answer. I'm waiting. I'm not seeing. Is everybody else seeing the poll? I am up? seeing the poll. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Excellent. I'll play the Jeopardy. I'll hum the Jeopardy song. <laughs> How do we know? Let's see. 50 out of 80. So oh, the poll closed. Did I close the poll? No. So, okay, so the poll is closed and 50 people out of 91, 91. voted. So we have 50%. Interesting, it's not what I expected because this started out as a talk to a camera club, but I think it's no longer a talk to a camera club. Oh, maybe it is. Share, share your results, Alan. I think there's there we a go. Okay, to share. I didn't realize I needed to click that. Now, now you're seeing it. So, so smartphone won. I actually thought that DSLR would win. So we still have about 30% of the people who answered the poll using an SLR, then a DSLR. Some people have a, a point and shoot. I, I didn't know, I don't know if you can still buy a point and shoot. Uh, a mirrorless, okay. And- you didn't, ask, you didn't ask us what we used. We own was the question. Oh, the second, the second question was what camera do you, oh yeah, the second question, sorry, sorry. Let's see, now I'm scrolling down. The second question, did people answer the second question? The first one is what do you own? And the second one is what do you use? Maybe, maybe relaunch the poll and, and if everybody will scroll down, there, there should be two questions. Uh, I have answers for the second question. Oh, I only have one answer for the second question. Yeah, so we'll give you more time. Scroll. Go How ahead do and I relaunch. relaunch it? 
How do I do that? I think there's just another reopen the poll or relaunch the poll. I'm going to stop stop sharing the poll. I will relaunch the poll. You need to have multiple answers to the second question. There, there are multiple answers to the second question. No, this one. You only allow one. Scroll we only allow there. one answer. Correct. She wants to know which one is your go-to. Well, for the second question, I'd like to know which is the camera you're actually using. Because you well, could own five wait, cameras. Wait, right? shoot. Are you ready to shoot when you're sitting on the street? Or are you shooting your clients? That's a different question. I'll leave that to you because everybody will have a different scenario, right? All if right, we voted question. once, should we vote again? I think so, because only one person, I think, voted. Oh, one answer. I'm sorry. One answer means you can only choose one answer. I misunderstood it, too. Right. So we have 53, 54. We're getting up there. But I'm sure most of us use more than one camera one yeah well day, then let's one let, one. Let, let's be like liberal and and the answer would be the one that you favor <laughs> okay how's that depends what the situation is it okay. absolutely does it does it does and maybe some people won't be able to answer but let's not get stuck on that okay so i think i will end the poll we have 70 we have 80 percent um having voted and we find, I find that most people, 72% of the people, oh, share results. Sorry, I'm not from experience with polls here. So smartphone seems to be, that's really surprises me. Um, I'm not surprised that everybody owns a smartphone because we all have, have phones, but I find it interesting that more people are actually using their iPhone than are using their DSLR. It depends that's that's not what I expected. Again, of course. What? It depends on the situation, of course, professionally. Of course it does. My DSLR, right. if I have a husband having dinner, I use my smartphone as my purse. Right, right. Of course it does. Yeah. And some of us have switched to our smartphone and have perfectly good cameras sitting in the closet. That's true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. That's what I was wondering, if that was the predominant case. And I just but, did a trip and I shot with a DSLR, a mirrorless, and a smartphone. Yeah. Let's see. All right. So, so now hiking, I bet you weren't climbing mountains. <laughs> All right. So, so All since, right. since time yeah. is limited, I'm going to keep us focused. Right. Everybody, and, please mute except for the speaker. And, we'll and the, continue next, on with the, the presentation. next thing I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put in the chat and we'll, we'll get we'll give you one minute. Um, what you what are the what you think are the primary the primary, either singular or plural, limitation of the smartphone. What's the problem with the smartphone? Although I, mean, I'm, I, do, I really find it fascinating that so many people are using it. Which may mean that this is predominantly a non-camera club audience at this point. Are we putting this into the chat now? Yes, please put yes that type it only in the chat. And, and if yeah. everybody can remain muted, please. Because we're gonna spend the rest of the hour talking about what are the limitations of the smartphone and what can be done to overcome those limitations so that the smartphone camera can become, you know, more and more widespread and usable. Is anybody looking at the clock? Are we done with a minute? All right. So, you know, I think I, I can actually see the answers. So why don't I look at the chat right now? For the questions, I'm not going to be looking at the chat, but right now I will be. And you'll see me turning sideways because I have a second computer next to me where I'm looking at the chat. Um, okay. So let's see. Somebody uses both of these. Let's see. It's because the phone, wait a minute. So problems I'm seeing here, it shakes too easily. Okay, so image stabilized. The image stabilization in camera blur happened when it shakes. It has a wide angle only. It does have, it's a purported telephoto, but it's not really a telephoto, we know that. And the distance would be the same thing, telephoto. So lenses, lenses coming up. A lot of people are talking about lenses. 
Other people are starting to focal length is lenses. Um, sort and download images is actually not a problem with iCloud. Let's see, limited dynamic range and limited resolution. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to address that. Um, I don't know what too big an image is. Limited to zooming, absolutely. That's a lens issue again. Um, distance and wide angles is lens. Can't optical zoom, lens, 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 lenses. We're hearing again. Somebody prefers the viewfinder, interesting. Zooming again, um, difficulty with night. Yes, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, filters, actually you can use filters. Um, I have a full, you, you can use a full filter pack on the iPhone with an adapter. Low picture quality, that, that, that is definitely a problem. Um, aperture and shutter speed, it can actually be controlled with outside apps. Um, let's see, in the, the 12, you can control that. So, okay, it's starting to repeat itself. Select the focus is lenses, 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 and quality. So mostly lenses and image quality is what seems to have come up. Um, all right, so let's, let's, very good, thank you. And so what I'd like to now do is, is to talk about those limitations and, and see what, what can be done about them with the artificial, and that's where the artificial intelligence is coming in. So obviously the purpose of a camera is to, it's a light, it's a box with a lens on it that lets in light and then records that light. Um, the lenses that everybody talked about um, are small with a fixed focal length. Um, uh, and the sensor, which is analogous to the film uh, is very small. So it doesn't capture as much light as the larger cameras does. And it also has smaller pixels on it. So, a camera with a large set, a physically large sensor that said it was 12 megapixels, and a phone sensor that's teeny tiny that says 12 megapixels, the size of the actual megapixels matters. So 12 megapixels and 12 megapixels are not always equal. Um, so that's where the artificial intelligence comes in. The problems that 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 you suggested that that fell right into what I'm I'm saying here, so that we know we're on target. Um, Soft, artificial intelligence is right now um, attempting to overcome these problems and getting better and better every year. And it's really phenomenal. Um, here is the size of the sensor of a full frame DSLR camera. The um, iPhone sensor is, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the factor of how much smaller it is, but look at how teeny tiny or much teeny, more teeny tiny. And look at the comparison, obviously, of the lenses. There's a DSLR lenses and here's the iPhone lenses. So let's let's think though, because we just we just expressed serious limitations that have to do with the size of the hardware. Yet the statistics show that in 2007 the iPhone was launched, the the smartphone camera, the the smartphone camera. In about 2011 there was a crossover. The, it crossed over and the DSLR and the phone. So it's phone, not just phone camera. So I'll admit that there's a slight skew in the statistic. Um, but look how, look how the iPhone is up and the DSLR is down. And we do know that the single most reason people upgrade their phone when they really don't need to is because they want the new camera. The camera is the biggest selling point on the phone. And look what's going on. The DSLR is 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 heading heading into the graveyard. Um, so let's let's talk about how does the artificial intelligence in the phone, that is the software, compensate for these problems that we've been talking about. And there are six main ways that we're going to look at. Uh, we talked about exposure. So it so the software can actually control exposure. People talked about poor image quality due to that small sensor. The software will enhance the image quality. It will enhance textures, details, and noise with a feature called Deep Fusion. Software can actually simulate the blur that we get from the optical uh, when we have a when we have a lens open wide open a, a long lens. Uh, we get the the soft blurred background that we all love in portraits called uh, bokeh. And software is now getting better and better at simulating that. Um, in the video arena, the software can simulate um, a, a short video that loops round and round, that bounces back and forth and up and down, and can even create a long exposure that 
unless you're putting it under a microscope, is a pretty good, uh, I'll say fake, simulation of an actual slow sp shutter speed taking a long exposure, let's say, for example, of a waterfall. Um, it enables low light photography, although at this moment with the camera I have, although I, I know um, Dave, David, our host, ha had a different experience with, with his Android camera and taking night astro, astro photography. I'm ha I can't really, ha I couldn't succeed at it with the, um, with the iPhone yet, and that may be just me. Um, it also, this is for advanced people, and I'm not going to talk about it, but I do want to mention it, that people who know what I'm talking about, and it will be everybody here. Um, the, uh, a major complaint about iPhone cameras is that they shoot JPEG pictures. Uh, contrary to popular belief, you can shoot a raw photo with, with a external camera app. And with the iPhone 12 and 12 Pro Max, Apple released its proprietary raw format that ups the quality of a Adobe raw, raw format file by doing some image enhancing. Um, exposure and sharpening on the raw file, but not discarding any data. So for those who knows what I'm talking about, this is really quite phenomenal. Okay, so you know what, my, something is covering it so that I can't see my own slide, your picture, your faces. How do I move them? Wait a minute. I can't even, I can't see my own slide. Uh, I can't move it. Oh, here we go. I'm able to move it. Okay, there it goes. All right, so um, let's talk about these six different points. Um, exposure control. How, so so what, what, what I want to do is explain to you the, 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 the amazingness of how this all works in a non-technical way. Um, many of you know what uh, HDR is. HDR stands for high dynamic range. And people, the photographers among us remember that if when they used film, they would exposure bracket or still with the DSLRs, you, you bracket the exposure. So what I'm what that means is that pictures have a range of brightness levels from very dark. So let's look at uh, this man here, very dark in his hat to pure white, let's say in his beard. And that can be represented um, with a with like a bar chart uh, with black values being on the left and very dark here and then going up in a gradient to white on the right. Okay, so the camera doesn't see the way our eye sees. I think that, that one of the things about being a photographer is to understand the difference between the way our eye sees and the way the camera sees. The camera sees a limp, can see a limited range in this gradation from pure black to pure white. And the more expensive and the better the camera you have, the more fine tuning in the way the camera can record light to dark values. A lousy camera can record, let's say, just in the middle of this gradation, and a better camera can get further and further without getting more technical. So what what the way, the way to compensate for that is to take a picture that correctly exposes the dark values, let's say the middle values, and then the white values, and then blend them all together in Photoshop. That is very labor intensive. And a lot of people don't know how to do it. And it's a pain in the neck, if you want my opinion. The, the artificial intelligence in this little tiny phone camera is at work before you even press your shutter. While you're looking through the viewfinder, it's, it's a live viewfinder and it send it, while, the view, while the camera is on and the viewfinder is broadcasting to you, the camera is actually taking pictures. So that by the time you've actually pressed the shutter, the camera has already taken a few pictures. So the camera with the smart, smart HDR and it's in some of the models and not in all of them. So some of you will have it and some of you with older phones won't, but in the, in the, in the more modern phones, it takes nine images at different exposures. It then analyzes all those images and it blends them together into one final image and you don't even know it's happening. So, I mean, I find that really amazing and it saves all the Photoshopping. I'm a lazy person basically. And one of the reasons I like the iPhone is because it's doing the lifting for me. It's actually correctly exposing the picture 
um, for me in a way that would be really labor intensive for me to do with a bigger camera. So let's take a look at what that means. So the picture on the left, this is um, my sister's dining room chandelier. Thank you, Nina, for letting me display the picture. Um, so the picture on the left is one single exposure. This is, has the, the feature, the Smart HDR feature is turned off. And the picture on the right is a blend of nine different photos. And you can see which one is the better picture. And for those of you who can read the histogram, you can, you can actually look at it at the bottom. There's some missing pixels in, the, in this area right here. And, and all the colors are missing out of this picture. So if you're taking with your DSLR, and depending on what kind of sensor the DSLR has, you may get a picture that's more like this, unless you've bracketed it and blended them together to get a picture like that. So that's the software at work behind the scenes for you. Here's another example. Um, I, uh, uh, David said I work at UMass Boston, and every morning when we were still going to the campus, I would start with walking along the harbor. This picture was taken with the feature turned off, and it did not correctly expose the clouds. It's it lost all the detail in the clouds, whereas with that feature turned on, taking the nine pictures and blending them together in a split second, it I'm not saying these are not meant to be good pictures. These, these are meant to be teaching pictures. Um, but it illustrates the major difference. Look at these. We, photographers will know the term blown out highlights. So these, these light values have no detail at all in them, whereas over here they do, because it's an exposure blended picture. And most people don't realize that your phone is actually taking multiple pictures and blending them together. And here's, just, here's another example. Um, where the, the, the single exposure got it down here, but it lost the, the bright values and the multiple exposure was able to, to do it. So let's see, how are we doing on time here? And are there any questions that have come in that are on this topic? We're about halfway through the hour and yep. nothing, nothing specific to, uh, to this other than there was a question about was the lecture about only iPhone. And I had replied to the, the person that uh, it's similar concepts with no matter what phone it is. Yep. It, it originally was going to be only about iPhones, but then when we realized how many, uh, what the variety of people that were going to attend and it was no longer just photographers, it was certainly not gonna be just iPhones. So I've tried to take it up a notch and I'm calling it smartphones. I don't know the Android phone. So when I talk about features, I can only talk about what I know. So uh, I'm explaining it in terms of what I know about the iPhone. And, and we saw from the poll that more people are using the iPhone. So hopefully everybody's getting something from what I'm saying. Um, Ellen, let me, yep. while we're talking right now, a yep. question just came in about, do you need a pro model? And maybe if you can describe the differences between the latest versions of the iPhones and what the distinction is between Pro or, or not, and if you lose some of these HDR features. Um, I believe, and I may, let, let me go back in my slide because I made a note to myself. Oh, uh, the, the, the smart HDR came in on the iPhone 10s. So before that, the, the, the iPhone, let's see, I had the iPhone 10 and it had HDR, but it didn't have smart HDR. And I can't tell you the difference between them, but it has to do with the software. And I do know that each time this, the phone is upgraded, it gets a new chip, it gets a new computer chip in it and the chip gets more powerful and the chip is able to do more things. And part of this whole thing with artificial intelligence, and I don't understand how it works, but it's, it's the machine learning. The machine takes large sets of data and it, it I don't know, it learns from them somehow. And, and the chip actually gets more powerful, it gets faster and it gets better. So I, you don't, if you have an iPhone that's, that's 10 or under, I don't think it has the HDR, but don't, Success has it. My husband is telling me that the success has right. it. Somebody that was a comment in the chat? thing. Okay, so somebody might be able to answer the question better than I have because I, yeah. I had never had a success, and I, I actually don't know. I thought it. 
I do know, but I do know that the smart HDR, whatever the differentiator is, maybe it takes more pictures or maybe it's able to blend them more seamlessly. You don't need a pro model. Don't need a pro model. Pro model has features that right now that the, the, the 12, I just bought myself the iPhone 12 pro because it has the ability to shoot the raw files, which are uh, 10 times the file size of the non raw the jpeg file and have infinitely more data that can be used in photoshop or in lightroom to, to process them um, the differentiator i think between the pro and the non-pro models really happens in the 12. that's where it makes a big difference there's a there is a substantial difference between a 12 and a 12 pro and a 12 pro max unlike the 11 pro max which was the same but just physically big, bigger looking than the i think no, I'm getting onto thin ice. I'm not sure. I'm That's not okay. sure. There, but there are some know. people putting in comments in the chat ah, that, are, that are addressing Maybe. some of these. So go ahead and continue Maybe, on with yeah, the presentation. Yeah, people can help me answer the questions. That yes, go ahead and continue yeah. on. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So let's see. So the first one I talked about was exposure, that the software is helping to compensate for the uh, the small hardware. And this, the next one is image quality. Um, most people do know what grain is. Gra uh, not grain. Noise. Noise. No, um, the way the sensor works is it ca captures um, whoops, captures photons. It captures electrical signals, and then it turns them into an image. It's just bits and bytes before the, the software turns it actually into an image. And it captures stray, stray, stray strands of, not strands, but stray molecules. I don't, I don't know the technical term that come in the lens and creates an image that looks very much like a, a photo with old film grain. And I found this, this picture uh, it, it was it said it was digital noise I thought it was really pretty and it's kind of sometimes you see these little spots of color um, on, on your picture but the software um, so the software can correct for this um, this is what I, what I was saying before before you press the shutter the phone camera actually takes um, with this deep fusion feature not the HDR feature, but with the deep fusion feature, when that turns on, when it detects low light, it turns on, I believe. Um, before you press the shutter, the camera takes eight images. When you press the sh shutter, it takes another one. And then somehow it analyzes every single of 24 million pixels. And this is right off the Apple website. I'm not inventing these numbers. Um, for, and corrects for the detail like, instantaneously. So while the sensor is small and the, the, it, it is capturing noise, the software is attempting to eliminate it. So that's the point I wanted to make. Um, the software can also um, create that soft blur. The lens itself can't because the sensor is small and the and the the it's a wide angle lens as many people noted when we were talking about the limitations so optically the the lenses cannot produce this softness behind it and this is a picture i found on the internet i'm sure taken with a dslr or a film camera um but what the the way this works the way the software does this it's really very interesting if you think about it if you only have one eye like you as a human being if you have one eye you lose the but you lose your depth of field perception um, people who have mono vision like some people get their cataract surgery or contact lenses so one eye sees for driving and distance and the other eye sees close for reading you lose depth perception that way and the reverse is the way the software simulates it. The, the, the iPhone cameras that can do this have more than one lens. So if you have an old iPhone with one lens on it, it doesn't have the portrait mode. The portrait mode came in with a second lens added on, when, on, on cameras that have two or more lenses. And the software needs data coming in from two lenses that are slightly off from each other. And by by analyzing the data from the two lenses that are not seeing exactly the same thing it does calculations and creates the a map of depth in the picture and with other machine learning it can identify the subject and then what it does is it takes everything that's not the subject and it blurs it somehow 
you know, algorithmically. The iPhone 12 has a different way of doing it. It actually has a LiDAR scanner, which actually bounces. It's, um, it's right here. Well, you can't see it, I'm sure. Underneath the lens on, on the iPhone 12, it bounces a, some kind of radar type sig sonar, I don't know, signal off, off the scene and then creates a depth map. And then with that depth map, it, it does software calculations to simulate the, the blurred background. So let's take a look at that. So this was done in a shopping mall. The one on the left, this one, um, the portrait feature is turned off. This is with the, the regular the regular shooting mode. But this one, look at the background. See how it's blurred? Now the question is always with this software is whether it correctly identifies the subject. And I'm gonna show you um, an example of where it actually didn't. And here's my husband who's sitting lovingly next to me. Um, he needed a headshot. So the picture that the camera actually took and saw is the one on the left, but it very well isolated him from the bookcase he was standing in front of. And then I cropped it in and did a little um, editing on it to, to put a spotlight on his face and smooth his skin a little bit. But I don't, I don't know, I, I would be hard pressed to know that this was done with software and not, not with the optics of the lens. And then um, the portrait mode, this, this blurring of the background, in, I think it's the X, XR, it does not work, it does not work on subjects that are not human faces, but on the 11, on the 11 series and on the 12 series, it does. And I took these with an 11 Pro, and so the, the background is being appropriately blurred. And then one more example here where the software actually made a mistake. So this, this one here was taken with the without the portrait mode turned on, and this one has it turned on and it missed right here. It did not correctly identify that these wires should be in sharp focus. So, so it, it, it messed up a little bit. Um, let's see what time, I'm getting to the end. So it also can simulate special effects in video. And I was gonna demo this for, for you, but I think I'm gonna pass by it in the, in the name of time because I wanna open it up. And I have a feeling I might be talking too much. Um, low light photography, um, the software compensates by boosting the signal that comes into the sensor. Um, when people think of night photography, they usually think of a very long exposure with a wide open lens. But contrary to popular opinion, if the iPhone is taking a long exposure, it's not actually taking one long exposure. It's taking many, many, many exposures. It's an exposure blend like we've talked about before. So the camera analyzes the light, the software analyzes the light and it turns on the low light feature when it when the sensor indicates that that it's there's not enough light ambient light in in the uh, scene, it analyzes that light, determines how many pictures to take and the shutter speed of each, and then it starts firing away. You're not aware of it. It's it's taking many 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 pictures, bracketing all the exposures, and then amazingly, it's aligning the frames to correct for movement. It's throwing out blurry frames. It's fusing all the sharpest pixels together and giving you what you think is one image. It's then adjusting it for color. It's reducing noise like we talked about. It's enhancing details, which means it's enhancing edge, edges and contrasted edges. Um, we didn't go into live mode um, to save for time, but in live mode, those of you who have iPhones will know what that is, uh, or now you've heard of it and you can explore it. You can see individual frames, but with um, the night mode, you can't, you get one picture and you think that your camera has taken one picture, but what actually you're seeing is a picture that was taken over time. So if you wanna get really abstract about it, it really um, stretches the notion of what is a picture. Is a picture, the, the recording of a second in time. Well, with this kind of photography, it no longer is because what you're seeing is that you're getting multiple pictures taken over extended period. Now, I mean, when I say extended, I, I don't mean like extended, but um, you know, could be seconds of time and, and blended together. 
And so how does this night mode work? I don't think at this moment in this his, you know, in this development of this technology, it's all that good. The one on the right was for sure taken with, with an optical lens. And the one on the left is the software simulation. And it was dark when I took this picture, it was nighttime. And it, it I think it messed up the colors and it didn't, it didn't really get it, get it right. Ellen, and he, uh, can I just uh, cut in? There was a question. Can you, can sure. you do things handheld or, um, or do no. you need a tripod with the phone? You don't need a tripod. It's, it's all happening handheld because the software is, is detecting the blurry part of it and, and, and removing it. If you put the phone on a tripod, you'll do better though. Because when the when the phone the phone it's amazing it has a gyroscope in it, that's how it's doing image stabilization. Um, with it, it's either doing it with a gyroscope or or or, like, or mathematically, but it has a gyroscope in it. And when the gyroscope um, understands that there's no motion, no, when it understands that there's motion, it takes a shorter shutter. Uh, it it closes the shutter faster. It's a shorter shutter speed. But if it detects that the, that the camera is, it, it will know if the camera is on the tripod. The, the phone is smart enough to know if it's on a tripod. And if it's on a tripod, it will hold the lens open longer. So you'll do much better with a tripod. Great question. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions on that? Um, so, so here's another example, a, a boat washed up on the shore. I mean, I, I took this picture. The one on the left is during the day and the one on the right is, it was nighttime. The sun was down, it was not the blue hour, it was really nighttime and the camera made it look like daytime. So I don't think this technology is there yet, but we'll do this talk again in five years and we'll see. It's, it's getting better with each iteration of the phone. And I'm gonna skip over the raw file. Um, so how are we doing on questions? If we open this up to questions, are there any? I'm trying to we do have, it time. We have about five or six questions or comments and, and maybe just touch on the raw file format okay. that it does allow you to manage the white balance a lot easier. Yep. So do you want to explain it or do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. So a, a raw file is, uh, uh, the format is dot .dng. It's a digital negative. And if you think about film, a film negative has all of the data. The light comes in, exposes the film, and it's all there. And there's no processing of the file being done in the camera. So a, a raw file is the raw data off the sensor. The file that you actually see when you shoot it on a phone, and I'm not, I don't have a DSLR, so I really, I actually don't know, but I, I think you can set DSLRs to shoot in a JPEG file format. A JPEG is a the, the processing that you might do in Photoshop is being done in the camera, and then the file is being compressed by about 10, a factor of 10. So a raw file, a, a typical raw file on the iPhone 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max is 25 megabytes, whereas the, um, the JPEG, which is image enhanced and all the things we just talked about are applied to the JPEG, and then on top of that, it's compressed. And when it's compressed, 90% of the data is actually discarded, never to be returned again. So if you wanna put your, your, your image file into Photoshop and adjust the white balance and the sharpening and the colors, you're not working with all the data that was in the light that was captured by the sensor. So if you're the kind of person who really wants to have full 100% control of the image processing, you would choose to shoot a raw file and, and, and work get, then you'd have every single pixel of data that came into the, this, the, the camera and was recorded on the sensor. The, does that answer the question I mean, in a clear way? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, were there others? Uh, one of the questions was about, uh, do you do all your, edits on the iPhone or are you using Photoshop or Lightroom? So I know how to use Lightroom. I know a little bit how to use Photoshop and, and can kind of get my way around it. But I do 90% of my edits 
on the phone itself or on an iPad because it's the same as the phone, only it's just bigger and I can use a stylus with it. And um, I don't think we have time for me to show it to you, but there's a program that two programs that I use predominantly, and one is called Snapseed, S N A P S E E D. It's a free free image editor by Google, and Photoshop run under the table because I mean it is absolutely amazing. I can do content for Photoshop people who know what I'm talking about. I can do content to wear fill to um, I can apply all kinds of filters it has the so not only does the phone have the machine learning and the artificial intelligence in it but the editing programs do too so you're getting the heavy lift on these programs um, when you're editing as well there's another program that people would be interested in it's called touch retouch touch retouch and that um, costs a dollar 95 and it it's a phenomenal program for removing blemishes and cleaning up pictures. I, I could remove a car sitting on a driveway and leave no trace of it. I mean, it, it's absolutely amazing. Let's see what's next. That, that was the raw file. And these were just the um, examples of the raw file. If you look at this graph of the light, of the dark on the left, right? And the gradient to the, the light part on the right, the, the JPEG file is the one on the left, and the raw file is the one on the right. The raw file is much richer, and it clearly has more color information and much more subtle gradations of uh, tones in the sky. You can see all the magentas in the sky. Here, you, you can't see it at all. And if you look at the, the histogram, the histogram of the JPEG file has all these, um, what would be a, like toothpick looking uh, verticals because in between it's missing it's actually missing data the jpeg has much less information than the raw file and the iphone 12 is the first iphone to introduce the what the adobe raw format which has the image processing on top of the raw file before that you could you and you can use it with the iphone camera that's part of the operating system earlier versions can shoot raw files but you have to download external app different apps in order to do it. So well, let me see. Can you comment, uh, some, co some comments, questions came in about HEIC files and how mm -hmm. those work and can those be converted or uploaded? So HEIC files are a high efficiency, H high efficiency image compression, maybe. Um, it's apparently a, a format that's a better compression than the JPEG. And from what I've heard, JPEG is going the way of the dinosaur and HEIC is replacing it. I can't really speak to it because I haven't modernized myself and I'm still using JPEG. Um, but when you said, can you upload them? I'm not sure what that means. What does it mean to upload them? I think they're talking about if you have that HEIC file format, when you transfer it to uh, Photoshop or Lightroom for editing, ah. is it necessary to convert it to JPEG in order to be more readily adaptable uh, no, for other programs it, or no. viewing? No, but it is a compressed file. So when you upload it into Lightroom or Photoshop to edit it, you don't have as much data. Just like with a JPEG, you don't have all the data and you can't do as much post-processing on it as you can with a raw file. I think that's what, what the question meant. So I think we have five minutes left before we turn off the recording. So let me pull it all together. Um, and and um, I think uh, David, when he introduced me, talked about the revolution in the technology that's as big a shift as analog to digital. I, I really think that's what's going on here. Um, we're, we're in the middle of a new industrial, something as big as the industrial revolution where the software is the cutting edge of photography. And it's called, I, I think I didn't, I think I somehow neglected to mention that it's called computational photography. And, and this is where the, the quantum leaps in technology are happening. And there's a, a startup company that I, in London that I, I had never heard of. In fact, when I was preparing to, to, to share this information with you, 
last week I learned about it and I got so excited because I thought, wow, somebody's really doing this. Um, they are, we talked about the limitations of the iPhone being the lenses and the sensor size, right? So what they're doing is they're, and, and, and I, I, I need to emphasize that the, the computing power in the larger cameras is like under the table compared to the computing power in the phone cameras. That's where the, the computers are in the phone cameras and the optics are in the big cameras. So this company has created a, um, an affordable, like $500, I think was the beta version, um, camera in which they're using the, the software prowess and, and muscle of the phone attached to a professional grade sensor and interchangeable micro four thirds lenses, which are not a full frame lens, but respectable enough to do real professional work on. Um, and I think, I think I, if I had lots of money, I would invest in this company, assuming that they're a real company. I mean, assuming that they're gonna manage the business well. I, I think they're really onto something. They're not the first people to have done it. Um, there have been other attempts in the past, but they were phenomenally expensive, like to the tune of $6,000 for a camera body, which is beyond most people. But, you know, $500 to $1,000, if they can pull this off. And it, they're, they're a team of, of artistic people and software developers, artificial intelligence experts who, who are trying to program a chip into the hardware that will leverage the software of the camera and the, the software of the phone and the hardware of the, of the big camera. And, and so, so now prof the professional photographers among this group um, will probably relate to this workflow where they take the picture on their camera, they then transfer it to the computer by the SD card or whatever kind of cable, they process it in Lightroom and Photoshop then let's say it's for web distribution, transfer it back to a modal, mobile device or print it and then put it out on the web. But with a camera like this, with the, with the connection in the phone part to, to the web and to Instagram and to Facebook and to all the mobile apps that it takes to build websites, um, et cetera. Whoops. In this workflow, right on the camera, you can take the picture, you can edit the picture and it can be on the web in a matter of hours. And I got very excited by this because the reason, one of the reasons that I've chosen to stick with the, with the, I, with the mobile photography is that I like instant feedback. And when I take a picture, let's say one of those pond pictures you saw, I like to know how is this gonna look after I process it? So I don't have to go home and go into Photoshop and, or a Lightroom and you know, spend two hours on it. I can put it into my Snapseed program and do a few changes in it Say, yep, that's what it's going to be. Now I have the feedback. I'll take another picture and I'll take it like this. And so I, I'm working much more in real time, which I, I really like. So, so one more slide, I think. Um, yeah, just to summarize, we, we talked about the limitations of the smartphone camera and then how the software um, can compensate for that. And then I'm going to leave you with the question um, to think about. I mean, what do you think about it? And in given the limitations of what you can do with it, I mean, there, there you, can, you probably wouldn't run a portrait studio with an iPhone. Not now, you probably wouldn't. But are there some professional uses that one could make of it, of this, this technology? And I have one more question that I'd like you to, to do in the chat. And the question is, what is the most important feature of the smartphone camera? We've been talking about it for an hour. I want your best guess as to what the most important feature or the most important element or whatever you think is the most important thing uh, in the smartphone camera. And I'm gonna watch the chat. Let's see, I'll, I'll read it out as they come in. I can carry it all the time. It's small, it's always with me, the HDR and portability, it's computing power. Any other creative ideas? Panorama, we didn't talk about that, but it has panorama, which is done with software. Reads the light well, the macro. I actually have, it, you can put external lenses on them. Anybody who's looking at me sees, I have, I have a macro lens with a 10X power. And you can text, yep, that's not in the camera, but you can text. Yes, you can send your picture in a text, yep. 
I, I see there's a reference to a previous chat, which it's already scrolled by me. It's small, it's good, it's reasonably good. Can't use it for the DS, can't compete. Fair enough, I'll agree with that. In many situations, you can, it can't. Software likes the software the best, the chips. Someone likes the photo stream. Okay, Bob likes the infrared. Photo process adjust and communicate. So that's the quick workflow. And, and I'm gonna have a different answer altogether. And my answer, the most important part of the smartphone camera, and by the same token, the most important part of the DSLR camera, the most important part of any camera is the photographer. So to quote Ansel Adams, the most important part of the camera, the most important part of the camera is 12 inches behind the lens. The real intelligence. <laughs> it's not the gear that makes the professional work, I think. Certainly you need the gear. There's, of course, I would never say that DSLRs can, can that a smartphone can do what a DSLR can do. That is not, if you heard that, you heard it wrong. But I will say that it's, it's this that's really the brains of the camera. We can talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning forever, but it's here. If you don't get the composition right, if you don't frame it right, if you don't, all the things that we know as photographers and that we come to camera clubs to learn about and share with each other. If you do that wrong, the fanciest Hasselblad on the planet will not serve you well. And I'll leave you with that. Thank, thank you thank very you. much, Ellen. Thank you. There's a few questions that we have. If you'll go ahead and, I guess, stop okay. sharing, and that way we can see yep. uh, the gallery and so forth. So uh, one of the questions that came in was, uh, they're looking to buy an iPhone 12 for the first time and debating between the 12 and the 12 Pro. Um, anything that you would recommend in terms of, is it worth the extra money versus the weight and so forth? So that's that's one question okay. for you. Um, Why don't we do the one at a time unless they're sure. on the same topic? Because then I'll forget it. No, go ahead. I will be honest. I've had this iPhone 12 Pro Max for a week. I, I stalled myself for six months to buy it. And it's just too big. <laughs> for, me, for, for me, I have a very small hand. It's very heavy. I carry it on a camera strap. I mean, I wear it around my neck all the time. But it is big. And my small hands have trouble fit, fitting around it. So that's a strike against it. But the reason that it's, this is the Pro Max, the reason that it's big is because it actually has bigger hardware than the 12 Pro and then the 12, and certainly than the 12 Pro Mini. No, the 12 Mini. So if the person asking, if, if, if whoever it is that asked the question, I was there's somebody who loves it, Bonnie Greenberg, I know somebody named Bonnie Greenberg. Is that my Bonnie Greenberg? Can't tell. Um, yes. Oh, well then, hello, Bonnie. Um, did Bonnie know I was talking today? <laughs> Word traveled. Um, I think it really depends on who it is that's buying it. I, I, I bought a 12, I bought a 12, not pro, a regular 12 for my daughter. It's fine camera. It's, it's a fine camera. It has all the same software. It has all the same everything, but the pro, the Pro Max, the Pro, the Pro and the Pro Max have the raw, the raw file, which I personally wanted because I've never done that before and I wanted to learn how to do it. And the Pro Max is what I bought because it actually takes in more light. It is, the hardware is bigger and can retain more light. So if that matters to you and you're spending the money and you have it, I made the choice to go with, with the Pro Max and I'm getting used to how big it is. Sure. So another question that came in was, uh, they have an Android phone and it allows them to select the HDR auto or HDR on or off. What do you mm -hmm. recommend? So the iPhone does the same. There's a setting in the settings panel where you can turn the HDR on or off. When I teach, I tell everybody to turn it off because if you, if you have, if you have it, let's see. I think it could be on auto or off. I think that's the, that I think that's the choice. If if it's, if it's on auto, you have no control over it. 
and the phone will determine whether it needs it or not, depending on the range of light to dark in the scene. In a high contrast scene, it'll turn it on. Is that it? If there's a big range of lights to dark, it'll turn it on and take multiple exposures. If it's a scene that's a kind of grayish scene, it'll turn it off. I like to turn it off in the settings and turn it on in the camera. When I had, I think with the 12 Pro Max, I'm still learning this one because I've only had it for, um, you know, like I said, a week. I think I have it set to be on all the time. I think that's how I have it set. Another question, and I think it applies to a lot of uh, phone users, is how do you determine which uh, aspect ratio to use, whether it's four to three, 16 mm -hmm. to nine, or square, or do you shoot in one particular one and then edit later in post? Or so later? I shoot in, the, in four to three. Four to three is the aspect ratio of the physical sensor that's inside the camera. Three to two is the aspect ratio of 35 millimeter film. 16 by nine is the aspect ratio of um, movie theaters, right? Four, three is television. And then eight, 10 is a crop of a three, two. Well, no, eight, 10 is a medium format camera, isn't it? Four, five. A four, five is the aspect ratio of a medium format camera. Um, Instagram requires a square crop or an four by five, which is an eight by 10, um, which is actually a crop of the four by three. So I shoot in four by three because that's what the camera shoots. That's the native crop native. to the camera, the native aspect ratio of the camera. Sure. Uh, another question is uh, any advice for people shooting fast moving objects like runners or cyclists rather than static scenes? Yep. So and, it depends on the effect that you want. Right, and they also um, asked, how would one introduce purposeful motion blur? Is there a quick way to lengthen the exposure? Uh, let's see, could you ask the first one again? It, uh, <laughs> okay. So for shooting fast moving objects like runners or cyclists. Thank you, Juliana. I'm, I'm looking at a comment. Yes, I'm listening. So uh, shooting fast moving objects uh, versus static scenes, is there a way to introduce purposeful motion blur? Okay, so I'm seeing Bob is saying there's a slow motion app. There is called, um, I forget the name of it, slow shutter camera. There's a slow, so I'm answering them in the reverse order. There is an app that will shoot a show a sl where you can take control of the shutter speed called slow shutter. Uh, Bob, you can put it in the chat. I think it was a Bob who made the comment that flashed by. Uh, slow shutter cam, I think it's called. Um, if, if you're taking a fast move, move yes, he, he's, he's confirming it, slow shutter. If you're taking a fast moving object and you want to stop the motion, then I would shoot it in a burst mode. So a burst mode means that you do however your camera requires you to do it. Some cameras you press on the shutter and hold it down. Others you push it sideways and that activates the burst mode. The burst mode is a rapid fire. And I forget how many frames, you know, frames per second, but it just shoots them until you stop pressing on, on the camera. And then lo and behold, I have discovered that the, the, the algorithms in the phones that I have had always, so you've shot, let's say a hundred pictures, you have to pick the best one. The phone, damn it, I shouldn't say that on a recording. Is it, no, it's still recording. We'll edit. We'll edit. <laughs> it's okay. Damn it, damn it, damn it. The phone knows the best picture. Now, that means that I have the same choice that the software engineers had, right? Because the phone doesn't really know anything. It, it learns what it's told. But if, if kind of standard aesthetics is to pick, let's say, a runner, you know, in, in, with a certain stride, the phone will select it and present it to you as the keyframe. It's 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 amazing. It's actually amazing. So an, another question is, uh, and this one we may have everybody just add their favorite uh, alternative camera apps in the chat. But the question is pretty open ended. Any do you suggest any alternative camera apps for the iPhone? Yep, I do. Um, so we're so so. Let me just back out to one level higher several categories of apps. The question was about camera apps. Those are apps that control the hardware and actually take the picture 
as opposed to editing apps, which accept a picture that has already been taken and then you do with the post-processing in it. So the question was about camera apps. So let's see, I have on this phone right now, um, camera plus two. Camera plus two is great for macro. It takes a much better macro than the close-up lens on the iPhone. But I also have an external lens from a company called Moment, like a moment in time, M-O-M-E-N-T. And they sell what I have come to learn is the highest quality lenses that you can attach to the phone by buying a special case with a bayonet mount. And then the, the little moment lenses, you, you line them up. This is a special case for all. I'll show you. I'm typing these in the chat for people, and that does cover one of the questions about. Yep. Uh, I have a special phone case. Can you see that it 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 it's shaped like a figure eight, and it it's designed to accept the mount of these lenses. There's a lot of lenses that you can put on an iPhone, but from from my three years of experience as as a self-described mobile photographer, I've done this for three years. I, I used to shoot with an SLR, never had a big DSLR. Um, but moment is the highest quality of lenses. And I just bought a used macro for, I think, $79. So, Excellent. you know, hundred plus or minus. And there was, did I, did I answer the question? Was there another? Yes, problem? no, I, I think so. And then one final, uh, comment slash question is if the iPhone quote doctors up the actual image, aren't we I seeing a come. fake picture? I knew that was going to come. It had to come at the end, right? <laughs> so that's the whole question. Is post-processing cheating? I think, I mean, what does it mean to be a fake picture? What is a real picture? I'm not going to answer that because, I mean, it, it, it's a whole nother program. And what is a picture in the first place? Because what what is a picture that's taken of of earth it's 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 a bunch of slices that are assembled into look like you know from the from the you know planet earth that picture that they uh you know the one i mean the big blue marble yeah exactly i mean is that really a picture i mean what is a what is a picture it's it, this is just a series of photons that are recorded on an electro on a light light capturing device that are then assembled um I don't know what a real picture is. All right. And, and, and I just, don't, but go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't think it's cheating. I don't think it's cheating. I think the National Geographic, if I were, if, if anybody here or me were working for National Geographic, you must take the picture. You can use post processing, but you can't remove even a piece of garbage on the ground. If, if it happens to be, you cannot change the scene. And to make sure that there's no cheating, you have to, once you do your processed file, that there are strict guidelines on how you can process it. And when you submit your picture to the magazine editor or to wherever it's going, you need to submit the raw file too. And they will check to make sure that you did not change the, the, the scene from the raw file. But so why is it cheating if I see garbage in my file and, and a, a piece of, um, a Coke can, a Coke can um, on the driveway. If I take a picture of my house and there's a Coke can on the driveway, is it cheating if I remove it? Or what if I had walked there with my feet before I took the picture and then went back and took it and it's not in the picture? Is one cheating and the other isn't? I mean, we've opened up a can of worms and right. I'm waiting for it to happen. <laughs> All right. And, and so what we'd like to do is thank you very, very much for your presentation this evening. Uh, everybody's waving their hands and and there's been kudos flying through the uh the chat oh, as well, well. You know what? we should so, can somebody save the chat for me it, it gets uh, saved automatically and i have okay. some screenshots already of all the oh, participants so like so we're good here i have no idea this thank, is very thank exciting. you so much and what we'll do is we'll give everybody a chance to uh unmute themselves and have a little friendly discussion um i will let you know uh, I'm an Android user and my wife shoots with the Google Pixel phone and the additional night scene mode that it has is an astrophotography mode. So the image in my virtual background is a, a Texas uh, sky from a very secluded place in, uh, near Austin, Texas. 
and it's amazing. It takes a four minute exposure and processes and takes multiple exposures. And this is the final picture right out of the, the camera. So I'll start off the conversation with that. And again, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourselves. We wanna build a little bit of camaraderie. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and we hope to see you at our next